Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. We are here with uh, Dr. Tara Rom. Uh, she holds a PhD in neurobiology from Harvard University. She's currently a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of California, Los Angeles. Uh, Dr. Rom has published numerous articles in leading academic journals, including Nature Communications and Current Opinion in Neurobiology to name just a few. She will speak to us about her ABS talk and its relationship to peace. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank Dr. you for Ron. having me. Thank you very much. Uh, first question, could you please tell us uh, a little bit about uh, the field that is neuroscience mm -hmm. and its re relationship with the concept of peace? Please. Sure, absolutely. Um, so neuroscience is among all the sciences, actually quite a young field. Um, and its primary concern is with understanding how the brain functions in a variety of species, all the way from insects to rodents to human beings, um, and relating uh, the functions of the brain to behavior. So how do patterns of brain activity give rise to behavior? How are they shaped by behavior and habits? Um, and culture. And so I think neuroscience has a really uh, important role to play in helping us understand more about human nature and about um, the, the biological aspects of human nature that, that give rise to behaviors which can either be conducive to peace or can, can thwart the, the advancement of, of peace. Very good, very good. And if you were to speak about the Baha'i intervention on the intersection between neuroscience and, and peace, uh, what would be the answer? What is the Baha'i intervention? Of, uh, of neuroscience and peace? And peace. Yeah, what is the Baha'i contribution to this debate? Sure, yeah. I mean, I think, the, you know, from the perspective of the Baha'i Baha faith, peace is not only the absence of war or the absence of violence, but it's really the presence of love and justice and um, a recognition of the oneness of mankind and the practical implementation of... Um, institutions, norms, social systems that are reflective of those principles and, and patterns of behavior. And so, um, you know, I think neuroscience as a field helps us understand the patterns of brain activity that are associated with both positive and negative aspects of human nature. So our, our capacity for cooperation, for love, for empathy, but also our capacity for violence, for pathological behaviors, for revenge, um, you know, our capacity to commit injustice. And so I think one contribution that the Baha'i faith can make um, is, you know, processes of spiritual education and, and spiritual empowerment, especially for young people, for, you know, children, youth and, and adolescents who their brains are particularly flexible and plastic, those early stages of development. Um, you know, so much about the brain is changing, important pathways are forming that set the foundation for uh, the habits of, that, that one develops as an adult. And so those processes of spiritual and moral education that help children and, and youth develop the capacity for love, forgiveness, you know, compassion, empathy, uh, humility, um, can, can play an important role in shaping these important neural, neural pathways that, that help them, you know, become constructive members of society as adults. Well, yeah. thanks for that. Uh, in, in a talk in Paris, Friends, Abdul Baha told the audience uh, that uh, I strongly urge you to focus all your thoughts on love and unity. Mm -hmm. When a thought of war comes, opposed mm -hmm. by a stronger thought of peace. So it, it seems like Abdul Baha is telling us something about the functioning of the brain mm -hmm. that thoughts and ideas must undergo transformation. transformation yeah. So, where does neuroscience? neuroscience come into play here? <laughs> that's a beautiful question. Thank you for that question. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Abdul Baha talks about how also the reality of man is his, is thought. his thought. Yeah, and so thought has a very powerful role to play in um, shaping our social reality, yeah. right? Not just thinking about it, but actually creating our yeah. social reality. Um, and so, um, you know, our thoughts can, you know, if we, if we develop the capacity to override our own negative thoughts, uh -huh. right, and to, to potentially quiet or dampen circuits in the brain that are hyper, hyper tuned to, sure. to, to thoughts of war or thoughts of hatred, 
um, you know, potentially we can, that can help us create a social reality that is, yeah. that is one that is more peaceful. You um, see, uh, Dr. Ram, uh, the public discourse out there, what we call the hegemonic discourse, mm -hmm. has a preconceived understanding of human nature and who we are. Mm -hmm. What does your research tell us <laughs> about human nature? Yeah, absolutely. Um, when I say this, we have a quite a negative understanding of human nature sure. as, as inherently self-interested, even nasty, brutish, mm -hmm. and egoistic. Mm -hmm. So uh, what is, or, or tell us about the contribution yeah. of your research to this particular question, that is human nature. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, so actually what you raise is a very good point. And so there's, there's some really interesting studies that show that when you survey the public about um, their understanding of human nature, um, and you and you ask them, here's a, a bunch of statements about human nature. Which ones do you agree with? Which ones do you not agree with? If you pair those statements with a statement about the brain, for example, you say human beings are selfish, or you say human beings are selfish, and and we actually identified the brain region responsible for that. People are more likely to agree with that statement uh, when there is a, a neuroscientific or brain related. Um, concepts that is paired with it. And I, th I think that's because it seems to have more scientific validity or it seems like it's hardwired into us. But I think uh, we have to be really careful and mindful of how we interpret those, um, those, those ideas, right? And because, because neuroscience can have such a strong uh, influence on, the, on, on public conception of human nature. And the reason why I say that is because we also know um, from a lot of studies from the field of cross-cultural neurosci neuroscience that um, patterns of brain activity and what we learn about the brain, even even true statements about um, about human nature uh, and 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 aspects of the brain that are associated with our lower nature are co very culturally sensitive. So uh -huh. people reared in different parts of the world who are reared in different cultures, their brains respond very differently actually to the same exact stimuli during the same behaviors. Sure. Um, and so, so th there's this whole field of cross-cultural neuroscience that's beginning to articulate all those differences. But the Baha'i community and the, and the Baha'i community's framework for, for understanding society um, has, has also a very important um, understanding of history. And so we, we sort of understand humanity as being in, a, in an, an age of transition uh, and that collectively as a human society, as a, as a planetary society, we're in what we would call right now our adolescence. So we see these fits and starts, right, of a burgeoning, more peaceful and just society, people's consciousness of justice and unity is, is developing. But also at the same time, we see stages of our childhood. We see war, we see famine, we see greed, we see all of these, um, you know, aspects of, of, our, of, our, of our history, of our, of our childhood that we're learning how to abandon. And so with time, our culture will also evolve. So the human brain may behave very differently a thousand years from now than it behaves today. And so when we hear studies and perhaps the news or we read an article about, oh, we found you know the, this, this pattern of brain activity that's associated with revenge or with hatred or whatever, we don't need to see them as fixed statements about human uh -huh. nature because we know that the brain is plastic and evolves with culture. Uh, we can see them just as snapshots in time like they're just descriptions about how the human brain behaves today within the context of this particular civilization and all of its assumptions and, and concepts and structures that shape human behavior and so I think in a way that it liberates us it allows us to be more hopeful and more optimistic and more humble about human nature and about that we're not tied to our just because our biology behaves a certain way right now it doesn't mean that our biology inherently will always behave that way. That so I, think, way. I think it's very exciting, actually. Yeah, it is. It is in every sense of the term. Uh, as someone in, within social sciences, I can speak at least to that. But at the same time, what I wanted to ask you is that I know a bulk of your research focuses on the relationship between culture mm -hmm. and, and the brain and ideas and the mind. Uh, there is a sense that while countries and states are territorial, cultures are not or not, and not basically. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, the, where does this uh, notion of norms and values come into play? Mm. So far as an understanding of who we are and and the question of peace is concerned. Mm. In other words, is there such thing as a culture of revenge, mm. and can it be transcended? Absolutely. That's a great question. Um, 
your question reminds me of this book called The Science of Revenge uh, that's written by a psychiatrist. And he um, kind of elaborates on what we know from scientific studies about revenge. And one of the things he points out is that when people act in, you know, they act out of vengeance, it actually, uh, it, it's concerning and it activates parts of our brain that are uh, engaged in our addiction circuitry. So these are the same parts of your brain that are involved in addiction to a drug or addiction to social media. So people can actually develop habits, problematic habits to become uh, addicted to vengeance, right? And so he actually frames this as a public health a public health crisis where he says, you know, the, especially in young people, that their, their habit and their, their tendency towards revenge, even for something small, like someone posts something on social media and you feel the need to get back at them for it, um, is, is a public health crisis. So I think in that sense, um, you know, some of the efforts of the Baha'i community and, uh -huh. and like-minded collaborators to develop programs for spiritual education <coughs> of children and junior youth to develop the capacity for forgiveness, uh -huh. for um constructive action i think are in a way like almost a public health yeah, intervention yeah, yeah. so that we don't develop this addiction towards sure. revenge and in order to unpack this even further yeah. uh, the baha'i conception of forgiveness somewhere abdul baha wrote see no enemy mm -hmm. even if you have an enemy and mm -hmm. i'm just quoting him see no enemy mm -hmm. forgive them don't be long suffering mm -hmm. nay <laughs> he's telling you that <laughs> he's not lying to that but see no enemy. Mm -hmm. uh, I always see that as a mode of emancipation, or mm -hmm. at least emancipating the mind when mm -hmm. he tells us that. It's for our own benefit not to see an enemy. Uh, what does neuroscience tell us about this? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of research upon uh, what's called in-group and out-group uh, recognition. So the idea of an, of an in-group is like the, the group that you identify with. So that could be uh, a gender-based identity, it could be a racial identity, it could be a political affiliation, it could just be a group of friends. Uh, and so that's your in-group. And people who don't belong to that in-group um, are actually uh, you, uh, considered your out-group. And so there's all kinds of studies on this looking at different, different types of in-group and out-group membership and how the brain responds to in-group and out-group membership. And actually what they have found, so one example is related to race, for example, and, and uh, the way white people perceive images of black people. Um, and they found that the parts of the brain that are active uh, during, during that process are actually parts of the brain that are very engaged in fear. Um, and so it seems like perhaps there's a component of prejudice or racial bias that might be very fear related, right? And that might help you to, that might cause you to perceive someone as an other or as perhaps an enemy in, in, yeah, a, yeah. in a very extreme form. Um, and what they found actually is that when you give people anxiety pills, that decrease the, the activity in the brain that is related to fear that actually help them to calm down, it also decreases their biased behavior towards those images. Um, and so, that, I mean, I think that gives us some insight that fear and, and not knowing who someone is or not knowing, having certain fears around an entire group of people that might be misguided, yeah. um, you know, can, can cause us to, to perceive otherness and perhaps enemies sure. in a way that is, that is not helpful. Um, I, and I'm not saying now that like an anxiety pill is the solution to like racial prejudice. Sure. I think that would be, that would sure. be reductive. Um, but it gives us insight into what is happening in the mind, right? That, that might be causing Absolutely. that kind of behavior. Yeah. I mean, for so long within social sciences, we have also been grappling with the same issues. Mm -hmm. uh, for so long, we have subscribed to the so-called Machiavellian uh, injunction mm -hmm. or calculus that if you're torn between love and fear it's always safer to be feared than love. Mm -hmm. Even international politics, that's the prescription we mm -hmm. follow, whether as a statesman or states. And, and, and in the world of diplomacy very much the same thing. But we see that signs of crack in that mentality mm -hmm. and the Baha'i faith kind of promotes a counter discourse, a counter knowledge to that. Baha'u'llah himself uh, love does not dwell in a heart possessed it's by fear. fear, correct? Just yeah. like that. So it's what you say about fear and how fear is being problematized mm -hmm. here reminds me of that that uh, that that aspect of Baha'i teaching mm -hmm. that it's always safer to to focus on love. On love, love, yeah, is right. and the greatest power in the universe. Uh, Abdul Baha speaks about. Absolutely. It. Yeah.
Yeah. But uh, beyond all, I want to thank you, Dr. Ram. Thank you. For this enlightening conversation. It was great. Thank you thank so you. much for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's our pleasure. And have yourself a great day. Thank you. Thank you.